Hey, 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 how's it going? Do it here, Sulfurs. Voila, my two-post car lift is here. Uh, I just finished installing it. I still haven't put a car on it and raised it yet, but we're gonna do that by the end of this video. And as you can see, obviously this is a bent pack two-post lift. However, I think I would have been happier with a Challenger or a rotary lift for the reasons we'll get into later in this video. But as far as this video is concerned, first we're gonna go over how these things work exactly. Then we're gonna go over the installation procedure. It's not gonna be a step-by-step -step procedure, but I'll give you a very good idea of how the installation will probably go. Uh, and then we'll go over some specifications and setups you really need to be aware of and look for if you're looking to purchase a two-post car lift. And finally, I'll go over why I think I would have been happier with a Challenger and definitely happier with a rotary lift. All right, so first let's go over the basic components of these two-post lifts. You obviously have two posts. Here's one post. There's a second post. On this setup, you also have an overhead assembly. And then inside each post, you have this piece. This is the arm head assembly. This is one solid piece to here, not including the arms right now. This piece will travel up and down inside each post by the way of these hydraulic cylinders. As you can see, you have one in this post and then the same setup on this post. There's your head assembly and there's your cylinder. And then obviously attached to this head, you get your arms. Next, the heart of the whole setup, which is the power unit. This runs off of 230 volts. You might need an electrician to wire this, but I'll briefly touch upon uh, you know, the wiring for this. It's a little confusing. The instructions aren't that great, but I'll briefly touch upon how this works. It's not super difficult, but the instructions definitely aren't helpful. All right, so when you're engaging the lift by the way of this button, this pushes out hydraulic pressure through this line. So inside the post, there's a T on the inside of this post, this is the power side post. Hopefully I can get you guys a closer shot. It's there. I don't know if the camera is focusing, but anyway, it tees off from there. One end of it will come down here towards the back of the post, travel down to the bottom of this cylinder. This cylinder on this side is resting against the plate. By the way, this connection is backwards. It needs to be the other way around. But again, the instructions aren't that great. Anyway, the bottom of that cylinder is resting against this bottom plate, and then where it tees off from inside of this post, it will travel up over the overhead assembly to the other side all the way down, and it will go to the back, to the bottom of this cylinder. All right, so next let's talk about the equalization cables, or these guys right here, this, this thick cable. These guys are attached to the top of there's two, two sets of these. This set is attached to the top of this head by the way of this, uh, this nut down here. And then it travels up through this post over on top of the overhead assembly and comes back down. And it's on this post, it's this guy right here. This goes all the way down to the bottom. There's a roller at the bottom of this. It will loop around that and come back up and attach to a bracket in the middle of this head assembly. Same thing on this side. On this side again, on this end of this cable, is attached to the top of this head, by the way of that nut. Same thing, this goes inside of the post, over the overhead assembly, comes back down. This, this guy right here, goes all the way down, loops around, and attaches to the bracket like this. I really can't show you guys this, because you know, even when it was time to put the, the end, that end of the cable inside that bracket, uh, you had to really reach the way down in there to put it inside the bracket. But, Anyway, the way these guys work is that you can lower or raise the, this head in relation to the other head by the way of this nut. You can unscrew it to lower the head, screw it in to raise this head. And that way, by doing this, you can make adjustments and make it exactly level with the other arms and head. That way, you know, when the car is going up and down, it's not going sideways, it's exactly going up level, it's smooth, and all that good stuff, which will keep you safe. All right, next, let's talk about your safety locks. You got them on both posts, they're operated or disengaged by the way of pulling on down on this lever. And the way this works is that they're connected by the way of this cable. This cable, as you can see, is attached to this one with the lever. It goes and travels again inside the post. All right, there's the cable right there. Up and again over the overhead assembly and down inside of this post. And then it comes out right here and attaches to this lock. As you pull down on that, this also comes out and disengages the lock. 
as you can see, here's the, here's the locking mechanism. That end, while, while it's inside the post, as the head goes, goes up, it will push that out, but as, as it goes down, it will engage the top of this lock on both sides and get locked in place. But yeah, on this setup for bent pack, on the back of these heads that go up and down by the way of these hydraulic cylinders, you have these rectangular uh, blocks that are welded to the back of these. And that rectangular blocks, which are spaced throughout the back of this head, as they go up, again, they will push this lock out. And then once you get to whatever height you want, and then when you set it, set it back down, since this is resting like this, they will come back down and rest on top of these locks. So that's why, as you have probably seen or know, when it's time to lower the lift, you need to first raise the car or raise the lift off the locks a little bit, and then you get to disengage the lock, and then you relieve hydraulic pressure by the way of this lever, and then the post or the lift lowers. And last but not least, you get your overhead safety switch, that bar right there, that's there so that your car doesn't get raised beyond the limits of your lift. And you know, as the top of your car hits that switch, that's a normally closed switch. Obviously, once it hits that, it will open up the circuit, cutting off power to your power unit. All right, so that's basically how a two-post car lift works. Of course, there's gonna be slight variations depending on the lift manufacturer, but you know, the main components are pretty much the same. You got two posts, overhead assembly, you get the heads, you get the power unit, the equalization cables, etc. Next, let's talk about whether you might want to consider getting an asymmetrical lift, like what I got here, or a symmetrical lift. All right, so the asymmetrical lift, again, which is what we have here, on these lifts, on these setups, you can see each post is tilted in 30 degrees. Right now, I'm facing directly this post. I'm not exactly in between the posts. I'm 30 degrees off. It's turned in on both sides. Each post is turned in 30 degrees. So with this setup, with that post turned in, the center of gravity of this post, let's say, if you were to draw a line straight from there, this way, and then if you were to draw a line straight from the center of that post this way, the center of gravity between these two posts wouldn't be exactly in between them, it would be further back. It would be somewhere around here, right? So if the center of gravity between these two posts isn't exactly between them, but rather, you know, further back, that means on most sedans, which are front wheel drive and you know, they have the engine transmission in the front as well, you can put about a third of the vehicle past these two posts and then two thirds is usually, about two thirds is usually about behind these two posts. That way, when you go to get in and out of the car, when the car is between these two posts, you have a lot easier time. These posts are you know, tilted again, 30 degrees, so the door can open out further. You can get in and out. And of course, as you can see, they have this rubber guard to help predict the door of your car as well. So yeah, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but on the asymmetrical lifts, one of the arms, the arms that's gonna be going to the front of the car is gonna be a little bit shorter. Obviously, the, the, the one in the back is gonna be longer so that it can go back and reach the pinch wheels or the lifting point of your vehicle. So next, let's talk about the symmetrical lift. The symmetrical lift, as the name suggests, is pretty straightforward. The posts aren't gonna be angled 30 degrees. They're gonna be facing each other directly. The center of gravity between the two posts on a symmetrical lift is gonna be exactly in the middle. And these are better if you're gonna be working on trucks or cars with a longer wheelbase because one, since these are gonna be facing each other, you're gonna have more room. You're gonna have a couple of inches on this side. You're gonna have a couple of inches on that side. You're gonna have a bigger, clearance for the drive-in clearance so you can get your truck or SUV in here, but then you're going to have to center that truck or SUV when you go to raise it. So asymmetrical is going to be much better for if you're going to be working on sedans. A symmetrical lift is going to be better if you're going to be working on trucks or cars with longer wheel bases. However, there is one condition that almost had me buying a symmetrical lift even though I'm going to be working on sedans, which is on a symmetrical lift you have the option of either driving in head first or backing in to the lift. Because, you know, the way I'm set up, you know, sometimes I want to, you know, remove an engine. If I had the option of backing into the lift, if I had a symmetrical lift, then on where the camera is set up, is set up right now, I would have a lot more room to remove the engine, you know, get the cherry picker in there and all that. But on this setup, I still have plenty of room up there. We'll cover how far you want to set up your lifts from the wall. But you know, it would have been easier. It's just, uh, just more convenient if you have the option of being able to back in or go in head first into the lift. But on an asymmetrical lift, which I have here, you have to pretty much go head first. 
on a symmetrical lift however you have the option of going head first or backing it. All right, so as far as how much space you need in front of the lift, on an asymmetrical lift, you need a minimum of 12 feet to the wall. Now, if, if I have this set up at 16 feet, uh, the car, the front of the car, let's say an average car is about 18 feet long, the front of the car, in this case, would come up here, and then I have, you know, benches and whatnot set up, and then this, I would have about, you know, seven to eight feet lift to, if I ever need to get a cherry picker in here to get in there, pull it out the engine, remove it, all that good stuff. But if you have, if you don't have enough room, but you still want to keep a minimum of this, minimum distance of 12 feet from the center of the posts to the wall. And then on the rear of these lifts, you, I think you need a minimum of 16 feet. Obviously I have about 24, 25 feet. So I have plenty of room there. All right, so next let's talk about setup. So when you go to pick up these lifts, if you're gonna be doing it yourself or whether they're gonna be delivered to you, these lifts, these posts, are obviously gonna be laying sideways horizontally, they're gonna be right next to each other. These arms are gonna be inside of each post. So, you know, these arms detach from the post by the way of this, uh, these pins. So the, the pins are not there, the arms are inside each post, making them very heavy. And these posts are attached at both ends. These brackets, the bottom plate on each post is screwed in to one end of the bracket and the top of each post is screwed in to this area of this bracket. They're laying right next to each other. Again, the arms are inside the post. The forklifts usually lift them through the middle. Nothing supporting them in the middle. However, they are covered by plywood, so you know the forklift is not gonna scratch or damage them. And again, the arms are inside the posts, and that's how you will get them. They'll be as long as each post, which is about 12 feet and change, and they're gonna weigh about 17 to 1800 pounds. So yeah, that's how they're packaged as far as receiving them. If you're in a commercial place and you have access to a forklift, it's not gonna be a problem. They'll deliver it to you and then you can use the forklift to offload it off the truck. However, I'm at home in a residential area. Also, I don't have a forklift. The other option so, is to go rent a box truck. In my case, you could have, go rent a trailer if you want. Uh, I rented a box truck with a, lift, with a tuck under lift gate. When I picked it up, brought it back, then got inside the box truck, we broke it up. We will uh, separate the, the two posts. The overhead assembly obviously got the arms out from inside of each post, making them lighter. Then I got furniture dollies underneath each post. We rolled them out, rolled them out to the edge of the tuck under lift gate on the box trucks. Then tied the loader of my tractor to the front end, pull it out until the other end was resting on the lift gate of the box truck. Then we, me and my friend, we lowered it at the same time to get it on the concrete of the garage and then we were easily able to roll it into the garage. All right, so you get them off the truck. Next, to install them, you need to set up each post approximately where you want them set up. Now, I set this up on the wide configur configuration on your two post car lift. This is gonna be whatever you manufacture the size. The narrow configuration was simply eight inches narrower, four inches on each side. I have enough room, so I set it up in the wide configuration. As far as setting them up, these are really, really heavy. That's if you're gonna be doing the lifting by yourself alone, like I did. If you have two people, even better yet, three people, it's not gonna be as hard. Most of the weight is at the bottom where the lift head is. So of course, when I went to, ra ra when I went to lift this, actually here was the plan, here's what the plan was. When I went to, I was gonna try lifting him, see how it's gonna be. So I grabbed the lighter end, of course. I raised it. In my head, I was thinking, hey, I raise it, I pull on my shoulder. If I, can't, if I can't do it, I'll simply put it back down, right? No, that's not how it's gonna work, at least not in my case. So I got it on my shoulder, I went to raise it. Halfway <laughs> through the process, I realized, hey, this is really heavy, maybe I should put it back down. Then I realized, there's no putting it back down, there's throwing it back down. <laughs> you cannot put it back down, so I simply had to dig down deep into my Iranian roots and give it the old wrestling move, which is the underhook, not a complicated move, but if you give it the underhook with the right arm, it gives you a lot more control. And then you simply inch forward, you know, using your legs to basically push it. And once you get it past a certain point, get near the top, of course, it's gonna be easier. So then after I put up the first post, I thought to myself, hey, if you didn't have the patience to wait for your friend to show up to put up these posts, what was the point of putting up one post if you're not gonna put up the second post. <laughs> so then I grunted my way and wrestled the second post and put it up as well. All right, so next basically you need to put the post into position where you should have already 
drawn some chalk lines. One at the end of each post, the, you know, being making sure they're exactly the same distance from one another, one through the center of each post, so that way you can line it up exactly correctly. All right, so next you'll need a four foot long level to level each post. I need to level on both ways, both in this direction and you know, this direction. And uh, this is where sort of my problem started. I'm nearly positive my concrete pad is level. After I put up the, each post, I went and measured all around, all around these posts. The concrete is pretty even. But when you put the posts on the concrete, in, in some areas, I had to put you know, almost 3 sixteenths of an inch worth of shims. These shims that I'm talking about, which come with bent pack. Get these guys level, and that's a lot. It shouldn't be that way. And then I realized, and uh, since it's not my concrete, it has to be this bottom plate on these posts. Now, and this is where my com you know, apprehensions about these lifts kind of started. I'm nearly positive the steel that's make, that, that these lifts are made out of is a much softer steel when you compare it to the steel for, a, let's say, a rotary or even a challenger lift. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm willing to bet if I was a bidding man, which I am a bidding man, <laughs> that these steels are pretty soft. Not every piece of steel is created equal. You can have a bigger piece of steel like these, have more steel, and then, and then have it be softer than a thinner piece of steel, obviously. So I think that's the case. And then remember when I said how these lifts were screwed into these brackets at the bottom plate? I'm pretty sure that procedure kind of bends the edge or the lip of these plates at the bottom where they're not even at all to where to the inside of this space, this space. So, you know, when you go to level these, you're gonna need a lot of shims, much more than sometimes, possibly, than uh, from what they send to you. So yeah, if you were to simply compare the columns of a bent back lift to a challenger lift, or even a rotary lift, let's say, the columns are bigger, the metal is thicker, but they weigh almost about the same. If you were to look at the weight of the package, they weigh almost about the same, while these guys are 30, 40%, thicker, bigger, and all that. So it has to be, this, this, this material is much softer than what the rotary lift is made out of, I'm positive. All right, next, according to the manual, it's time to use anchor bolts and anchor in our post. Now, according to the instructions, they want you to drill the holes for both posts and put the anchor bolts in, but don't tighten the, the nuts on the anchor bolt so that you can make adjustments. But what I suggest is to anchor only, you know, just drill one or two holes for one post, put the nuts on that one so that doesn't move, but then leave the second one alone and don't screw it in because you might need to adjust or move the post around a little bit. So, you know, if that's the case, if you already drilled the holes, then you're gonna be in trouble. But something else you need to keep in mind is that when, the, when you're trying to install the overhead assembly, the post that is not anchored in, if you hit the top of that post with the overhead assembly really hard, you could tip that over. It could fall on you, someone else, or run in your car. So, you know, this is a bit of a safety risk, but, you know, if you're very careful, then if you can be very careful, you know, cover all, all the bases, then this is what I would do so. Because you might need to move the posts a little bit, and if they're bolted in, you can't really move them. So you're gonna be out of, out of luck if that's the case. Also for drilling the holes for the concrete anchor bolts, you're gonna need a three quarter inch bit. That's both for concrete and rebar, and obviously you're gonna need a hammer drill as well. All right, so once the posts are up, the overhead assembly is in place, you simply set up your overhead safety switch, and then the hydraulic lines and the equalization cables are gonna be around here from before. You grab them, you run them over the overhead assembly to, other, to the other side. And then you obviously run the cable for your uh, locking mechanism, the latch for your locking mechanism. Again, through the post, over the overhead assembly to the other locking uh, lever as well. And actually, while running this cable for this locking or unlocking mechanism uh, is where I ran into another problem. And that is where this cable runs through or on the overhead assembly, it's running very oh, exactly over and very close to the wiring, this guy right here, that goes through the post, uh, which goes to the overhead safety switch. In fact, here's some footage I took while assembling this. All right, so here's what I mean. Here's the power side post. There's our power unit. You come up here to the overhead assembly. If you look here, here's the cable. That's for the safety locks. Here's our wire wiring for our safety switch up here. As you can see, this cable runs right above this cable, this wire. And as you use this, now, this is not tight, but even if it's tight, it's gonna raise up a little bit, and over time, this is gonna sag. It's gonna stretch, and it's gonna sag, and it's gonna hit this. 
it's going to be right next to it. Either it's going to burn through this and hit the wire and cause a short, or this cable itself is going to wear out and fray and wear out. Either way, this could lead to a very dangerous situation. All right, now as a remedy, as a quick remedy, I should say, I did, here's what I did. I put these uh, C-clamps on here to push this cable to the side. And as you can see, I have about a quarter of an inch of clearance. I also actually had to put two of them. Here's the other one, because otherwise, if I didn't put this, this cable would be rubbing against the, the clamp for the hydraulic line up here. That could also cause it to fray. But anyway, this is gonna be a short-term uh, fix. Longer term fix would be to, to get a small roller, put it under this cable, and raise it up a little bit, like this, and that would be a much better solution. But in the short term, this is gonna hold. Also, of course, you wanna deburr the edges of this clamp, because otherwise, they'll just rub against the edges of this clamp and fray. So make sure you deburr and smooth out the edges on these. So yeah, again, down the road, this cable can damage the, this, this wiring, cause a short, power can go through this wiring, through that cable, travel back, back down here, and energize this piece, but there's a cover that's gonna be here, I haven't put it on yet. So this, will, this piece will at least be covered, and this is, when you grab this, this is a, there's a rubber cover over this. So it's unlikely you're gonna get electrocuted, but this is gonna be energized probably. So yeah, this is a pretty basic engineering failure in my opinion, and I'm actually very curious for those of you that own these bent packs, if you have this model, XPR10AS, to, to get up there and take a look and see whether this cable has has sagged, has stretched and sagged over time and, it's, and whether or not it's rubbing against this cable now. I'm very curious and I'll bet you there's a good chance some of you are gonna see something that you don't wanna see up there. Now electrocution is one way this could cause you physical harm, the other way is getting squished and that is, the way that's gonna work is that cable, if that cable breaks, not just the wiring, if the cable fails and breaks because it rubs against those connectors up there and then you know, you, you raise the car, you're not gonna know it, the, 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 the latches are gonna click you're not gonna know, the, the arms are gonna go up, the car is gonna go up, and then when it's time to bring it down, you're gonna pull on the lever on that side, thinking, oh, you just disengage the locks on both sides, and then you lower the vehicle, or lower the lift, the, the car is gonna be, go down, and then you're gonna get, it's gonna be stuck on one side, this side is gonna lower, and it's gonna go like this, it could slide off the arms, and you know, it could crush you, cause you, cause you or someone else great physical harm. All right, so after you route all your hydraulic lines, the equalization cables, then it's time to install your power unit. Now, this is, it's not that heavy really, but it's just awkward, you know, most of the weight is up here, but at the same time, it's kind of tall. So, you know, putting this by yourself and then putting the nuts and the bolts in the back is gonna be difficult. I did it by myself, but again, two people, uh, it will go a lot quicker if, you, if there are two people doing it. But then after that, you need to bring in power now. We're not gonna cover, I brought power, as you can see through this MC, a 10 gauge cable, it's got two conductors and a ground. You're gonna need this for if you're gonna be wiring any kind of you know, 220 to 240 volt outlet, and this is what this needs, this is actually 230 volts. Uh, and the things I'm gonna say may not make sense if you've never wired anything like an outlet, but for those of you that have done this already, here's what you need to look out for when installing this. So basically, you got 210 volts through two conductors, two wires coming to this. One of them is going to go through the through the one of the wires that's coming coming out of this motor, and that wire is going to go to your overhead switch, which is going to be normally closed. So power is always going through that wire through the overhead switch back down to the motor, right? And then the second wire is going to go to this switch up here, which is normally open, and then from another wire back to the motor. Basically, that's all you really need to know. The, the instructions are kind of confusing, but all you need to know is that this is normally open. The other switch up top is normally closed. 110 volts is always flowing through that switch up top. 110 volts is not always flowing through this switch, only it flows when you, when you do this and completes the circuit to so get 230 volts and then the, this power unit starts working. All right, next let's go over another problem I have with the engineers that designed this lift and that is the first locking position of these arms is way, way too far off the ground. And that is important because when working on cars, most of the times you're gonna be leaning over the engine bay, or even worse, you know, trying to bending over, trying to dig down, and especially if you're on the taller side, I'm not super tall, I'm about six feet, six one. So, you know, being bent over the, you know, looking down the engine bay, kind of, it's kind of hard on my back. I would have much preferred for the locking position not to be so far off the ground so I could simply, you know, if there was a way to raise this car even maybe 12, 12 inches off the ground, 
you know, it would make, him, make working on the engine, bay or on the engine, a lot easier. But we're going to measure this. We're going to raise it to the first locking position. We're going to lower it on the locks, and then we're going to measure how far off the ground the arms are. So yeah, we're going to raise these until we hear the first click of the locks, and then we're going to lower it on the locks and measure the arms. There it is. Now they are lowered on the arms, and you can see right off the bat, it's way, way too high. All right, so hopefully, as you can see, the top of this pad, which is screwed in all the way in its lowest position, is 24 inches off the ground. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean when you raise the car, you're going to raise the car 24 inches off the ground because there's usually a bit of a space between the pad and the pinch wheels or the frame of whatever vehicle you're lifting, but it's usually not a whole lot. In the case of this Prelude, the space is only going to be an inch or two, which basically means you're going to be raising that car to about 22 inches off the ground to put it in the first locking position. So yeah, basically if you were to raise this car 22 inches, it would come up to here. The, this radiator support would be here. The valve, the top of the valve cover would be even higher. We just about here. And you know, it's gonna save my back from you know, bending over too much, but it's not gonna be doing me much good as far as being able to work on the car. Now on the other hand, I've had gotten the Challenger lift, which was the same, had the same rating, 10,000 pound lift, two post asymmetrical lift. That one, the first locking position was 16 inches off the ground, which would be right here. So right here, this would make a huge difference as far as being able to work on the car while, you know, having access to most of the engine bay at the same time not having to bend over too much saving your back. But I couldn't get a Challenger lift or a rotary lift because the wait time on those lifts is anywhere from three and a half, four to six months. While on the other hand, the wait time for this bendo pack was only about a week. And actually, if you look at it here, hopefully this camera can focus, you can see the manufacturing date, which is October 17th, 2022. And today is November 2nd, 2022. So in less than or about two weeks, this went from manufacturing to being delivered and installed. Of course, it helps that their manufacturing plant is only you know, three hours away from me. But still, that's really, really fast turnaround. That's basically why I have a bendo pack instead of a challenger lift. All right, so enough of that. Now let's put these arms back down and put the prelude in here and raise it and use this lift for the first time. What do you guys say? Next, we're gonna place our arms under the pinch wheel. Make sure they're in the center of each pad. Okay, here we go. Get a couple of inches off the ground. Give it a good, oh, oh this is solid. Yeah, this ain't going nowhere. <laughs> so there you have it folks, a working two post car lift in the garage. Pure awesomeness here. The amount of damage we can do both figuratively and literally speaking, I guess. It's gonna be great. I should be able to put out a lot of videos with this car lift. Now, one other thing I was worried about was uh, you know, exactly how far off the ground I was gonna be able to get this car and not hitting my head against everything. It looks like, uh, as the way it sits, the pads in, the, in their lowest position, I can easily hit my head against this, parts of the exhaust maybe, but then again, you can unscrew this. You're of course limited by the amount of space between the top of the pad and the pinch welds, which in this case was uh, is gonna be about an inch again. So, you know, I can raise this car another inch and that should, you know, should be somewhat comfortable. So I'm still gonna have to duck a little bit, but you know, hey, better than on your back with all the dirt and grime falling down on your face. All right, so what I'm gonna do next is to simply lower and raise this car a bunch more times, make sure everything works, there are no leaks. And then I'm gonna raise it and leave it in the same position, the highest locking position overnight, come back tomorrow, make sure the car is still on the lift, hasn't fallen off. Uh, actually kidding aside, hopefully, simply making sure that the posts are, aren't out of level, they haven't moved. Then again, check the torques on the anchor bolts. Actually checking the torques on the anchor bolts regularly when you first start these, when you first start using these lifts is very important because as you use these lifts and it moves and the posts move, they're gonna just slightly wedge the anchor bolts out of the ground, just a little bit. So you wanna make sure that without any weight on, the, on these lifts that you check the torque on those uh, anchor bolts 
regularly. So with that said, gonna wrap this up. Hopefully you liked this video. If you did, give this video a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already done so. And I'll see you in the next video, which will probably be either on a new parts washer that I bought or you know, replacing the water pump timing belts and other, all the other things that this car needs replacing. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.